All right, we're continuing this morning in our series in 1 Corinthians. Uh, we're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 uh, this morning, verses uh, 12 through 20. Um, but as we dive into this, I want to remind you what I talked about at the beginning of this series about the city of Corinth, which is that the city of Corinth um, was a pretty wild city. Um, it was um, a port city. Um, and so there was a lot of people traveling uh, through there, kind of temporarily, people that were there just for a night or two, um, and, uh, and they liked to live it up. And there was all kinds of uh, 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 temptations for them. There was lots of, uh, certainly lots of alcohol, lots of uh, prostitution uh, that was happening, um, you know, ways for people to, uh, to live it up for a night um, with no consequences. It kind of reminds me of um, maybe modern day Las Vegas. Okay, kind of similar to, uh, to Las Vegas. And, uh, and you know, what of course is, is the saying for Las Vegas, right? That what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas, right? That's the, that's the, that was actually a, uh, a tourism slogan that was made up for Las Vegas. The purpose of that saying being you know, come and do whatever you want, right? Get as drunk as you want, do whatever you want sexually, do whatever you want with, you know, gamble your money away, all those things. There will be no consequences. And similarly, Corinth had its own uh, slogan. They had a popular saying um, that was this, all things are lawful for me. All things are lawful for me was a popular saying in Corinth, um, and, and used in a similar way as, as we might use um, that saying, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. And Paul, the Apostle Paul, is going to utilize that slogan in the passage today as he addresses the church at Corinth. Let's see, in verse six, chapter 6, verses 12 through 13. It says, All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. Food is meant for the stomach, and the stomach for food, and God will destroy both one and the other. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. So Paul kind of addresses this popular slogan, uh, and, and we know that it was an existing slogan, an existing saying that was used, all things are lawful for me. And you can, you can imagine it being used in that, in that same way, right? That, you know, nowadays we have guys that are going to, you know, get a group of, uh, of hooligans that are going to go to Vegas, and they're like, oh, come on, man, let's go. What happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. <laughs> you know, and you imagine a similar kind of thing. Guys, some sailors getting off the boat in Corinth going, come on, boys, let's go. You know, hey, in Corinth, all things are lawful for me. <laughs> oh, yeah, all things are lawful. You know, similar kind of thing. And Paul utilizes this saying to address what he wants to say to the, to the Corinthians. But he modifies it. He modifies it. Because he, he agrees with it for the most part, but he feels the need to modify it. We could do something similar to what he's doing here with what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. right? We could say, hey, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas, but so does your money. Right? You could say, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas, but it keeps in touch, right? We could utilize it similarly. We could say a similar kind of modification that Paul is doing here because Paul mostly agrees with the slogan, all things are lawful for me. Paul was a big, was very big on the completion of the law, that the law had been completed and thereby abolished because it had been fulfilled by Jesus. And so he was constantly hyping up the freedom that we have in Christ and the freedom that we have from the Old Testament law. We see this in verses like Romans chapter 8, verses 1 through 2, where he says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. Are you hyping up the fact that they have been set free from the law? They've been set free from the law by being given the, the law of the Spirit of life that set them free in Christ Jesus. We also see this. In Galatians chapter 5, 18, where he says, but if you are led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. So Paul was big on our freedom in Christ. So this idea that all things are lawful for me, Paul's in agreement with that. You're free from the law. You've been set free. If you're in Jesus, you have been set free from the law. So all things are lawful, 
but that needs to be understood correctly. Really even understood correctly just in, in terms of common sense, right? Because he says, all things are lawful for me. What's his first qualifier? But not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. This is obvious, right? This is obvious that even if everything was legal, it's not necessarily helpful. And why would we want to do something that was harmful even if it was legal, right? Just because it's legal to do doesn't mean we want to do it, right? So there are certainly plenty of things that are legal but are not helpful to us. And as we seek to follow Christ, it's not about fulfilling the law anymore. It's about understanding that in Jesus, we find the advice we need and the, the help that we need for good living, right? For living well, for living an abundant life. And that living outside of God's design is harmful to us. That only when we live within the design that he has made us, live the way that he has designed us to live, can we live an abundant, fulfilled life. So we, while we could do whatever we want, we only want to do those things that are helpful to us. This reminded me of a discussion that we had at, at youth group the other night. There was a, a young, uh, young lady who was at a youth group, and, and she was asking us, um, me and, and some of the and Pastor Jason and some of the other youth leaders, we were just all talking with this, this one young lady, and, and she, was, she really wanted to get into, like, can I date somebody who isn't a Christian? And why couldn't I date somebody who isn't a Christian? And what we were, you know, she was just so focused on that, that rule, Right, this idea that it was like a rule or a law that you couldn't date somebody who wasn't a Christian. And we were explaining to her that it's not that we don't, that we, that we wouldn't want to, we wouldn't want to date somebody who wasn't a Christian. We were explaining to her the fact that, you know, we were, that, that we loved Jesus so much that as we sought out partners, and, and some of us seeking out partners, as we seek these things out, we only want to be with somebody who also loves Jesus as much as we love Jesus. That it's not about fulfilling this rule, it's about the fact that our decisions are driven by our love for Jesus. And, and so we, as we were explaining this, she said, she said, well, listen, I, I like Jesus, but I don't like worship the ground he walks on. <laughs> Can you believe that? <laughs> and we said, yeah, yeah, we know. <laughs> we do. And, and that was like a revelatory for her. Like, oh, wait, you do? Like, yeah, we do. Like, that's the difference here. And, and, and we explained to her, like, that's the difference. Is it's not about us trying to earn Jesus' favor. It's about living the way that he has designed us to live. And, and that we want to do that because we love him so much because we understand what he's done for us. So I told her, like, it's, until you get that figured out, don't bother. Date whoever you want. You got to fall in love with Jesus before any of this is going to make sense to you. Because it is not about us trying to do what is legal or what we're supposed to do according to God's law. It's about the fact that we want to do what is best for us and we know and believe that that is only found in him. Paul's second qualifier is similar. Right? All things are lawful, but I will not be dominated by anything. He's saying that all things are lawful, but we don't want to be anything to have mastery over us. We don't want to have anything that is controlling us because then we're not free anymore, right? If we're free to do anything, then if we fall into addictions that gain control over us, then now we are not free either, right? And so often we see that where people are falling into things and, and re enslaving themselves to these desires that they have or these addictions that they have to where now they are not free, it says, sure, all things are lawful for me, but I don't want to be dominated by anything. And Paul is really going after these addictions that people have, these habits that people have that tend to enslave them. And we can see the brilliance of the simplicity of this, right? That, that Paul, these are very simple and obvious things that anybody would, anyone would agree with, right? Anyone would agree with these things. You don't have to be a believer to agree with this statement. That sure, all things are lawful. Let's pretend there are no laws. You can do whatever you want. You still only want to do things that are helpful, not things that are harmful. 
you still want to be truly free and not be dominated by anything, not be controlled by anything. So why would it matter if you could do whatever you wanted? I remember when I was in high school, um, I played on the football team and um, and, and in the summer we would have these, these camps and I would hang out with all the, the, the guys that played football too. And, uh, and, but, but some things I didn't do that they did, which they would go off and they would have like parties and stuff on the weekends, um, you know, find whoever's parents were out of town or whatever and go have, you know, get, get wasted and, and all that kind of thing. Um, and I, I never really felt drawn to that, but I remember um, one summer uh, that, that particularly came like into focus for me because um, we would have these early morning workouts in the summer as part of our, our football camp. And, uh, and we had these like lifting groups where we would be in the weight room. We'd have certain groups we were with. And one of the guys that was in my group, he was a pretty wild guy. And he would kind of, you know, go out partying and stuff like that. And the night before, uh, or that weekend, he had, he had gotten really, really drunk and at this party. And, and in the course of being so drunk and being at this party, he got completely naked. Um, and he passed out in his, in his yard outside in the grass. And then, uh, because he was so drunk, he, uh, slept in out. Well, he slept out, but you know what I'm saying? He slept late. He slept late and late enough that the sun had risen quite a bit for quite a few hours. So he was naked out on his face in the sun for many hours. So he got, I mean, red, so sunburned, so sunburned. And he came in, because he came walking in like this, like just, uh, like he was a so sunburned, so bad. I mean, you can bet, I was so, I wanted to encourage him. So I got him a lot of good slaps, you know, encouraging slaps on the back and uh, that day. And he was just in so much pain. And I remember thinking like, why is this fun? Right? Why is this what you want to do with your life? This is not helping you at all. And that's what Paul is saying here, that all things are lawful, but why would you do something that wasn't helpful? Why would you do something that's harmful to you? Why would you allow yourself to be dominated by something? He utilizes a second saying, um, a second Corinthian saying, popular saying of the day, which is, food is for the stomach and the stomach is for food, right? And this was a saying that they would use to justify fulfilling their desires, right, to, to, to satisfy their own desires that, hey, it, you're hungry, you eat. That's what it's for. The food is for the stomach. The stomach is for food. Bring them together, right? Bring them together. But it wasn't just to justify eating whatever you wanted. It was also used to, to say, to satisfy whatever desire you had. And obviously, sexual desires were certainly involved in that. So this was a way that the Corinthians would justify these things. And Paul here asserts God's supremacy over them, right? He says, yeah, sure, the stomach is, food is for the stomach and stomach is for food, but God could destroy both of them. We'll destroy both of them in the end. God has the power, the authority, the supremacy to destroy everything that he has created. And he said, just because you try to say this and, and you point out this fact that, yes, we're meant to eat, but ultimately God is still sovereign over all of it. And the body is not meant for sexual immorality. Human bodies are not meant for sexual immorality. They are meant for the Lord. They were created by him. And so they are created for him. And he is the one who determines how they are properly used. Ultimately, everything was created for Jesus. As we see in Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 20. Where in talking about Jesus, it says this. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. 
All things are created for him. We are created for him. And as our creator, God determines our purpose and proper use. When we come to Christ, we surrender to him, acknowledging him as our Savior and as Lord, as the master over our lives. Continue here, verses 14 through 17. And God raised the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For as it is written, the two will become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. So Paul turns here to talk about our motivation for obedience. That we can and should not do anything to earn our salvation. Our motivation must not be to justify ourselves. We need to recognize that we have been justified by the blood of Jesus already. And so Paul poses this question to the Corinthians believers. He says, do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ. He's almost incredulous, like, maybe I didn't teach it correctly the first time. Do you not understand that your bodies are members of Christ, that we are members of Christ totally? And that includes our physical bodies, our members of Christ. And as part of the, members of, as part of the body of Christ, we will be resurrected just as he was, meaning We go beyond just this life. We are meant for something more than just this life. And so Paul poses the question, if you're a part of the body of Christ, why would you join yourself to a prostitute? And again, he's kind of unsure. Maybe they don't quite understand the nature of sexual intercourse. Maybe they have a bad understanding of what happens during sexual intercourse. So he explains it further that when two people engage in sexual intercourse, they become one flesh. As it says in Genesis chapter 2, verse 24, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. This is God's original design for sex and marriage. So he sees these two things. He's like, maybe they don't understand. They need to understand both of these things. That as believers, as people who are indwelled by the Holy Spirit, We are part of the body of Christ, totally. Not just our spirit, not just our mind, not just our soul. All of us are members of the body of Christ, physically as well. Our physical bodies are members of the body of Christ. Maybe they don't understand the nature of sex. That sex, when you engage in sexual intercourse, you become one flesh with that person. So if you are members of the body of Christ, why would you go to a prostitute? Why would you have sex outside of God's design for marriage? You are using part of the body of Christ for this. Now, what he's pointing to is the fact that it's important for us to recognize the power of sexual intercourse and don't allow ourselves to become callous to it. So often in our culture, people kind of make themselves calloused to the nature of sexual intercourse that as they continue to operate outside of God's design for marriage, they, they take the power out of it. They kind of callous themselves over and make themselves hardened to it. They harden their hearts and take the, try to take the power out of it. But we should recognize that it is powerful. Even if we've already had sexual intercourse outside of marriage, it's still possible for God to restore both body, spirit, and mind that he can restore us totally, even if we have already gone outside of his design for sexual intercourse and marriage. He also points to the fact that just as human beings become one flesh with their sexual partners, that we're also indwelled by the Holy Spirit. We become one spirit with God as well. And this is why we ought to take sexual intercourse seriously. It's not just our bodies that are involved. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit, both individually and collectively. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. We'll get into that more in this next section, verses 18 through 20. It says, flee from sexual immorality. Every other other sin a person commits is outside the body, 
but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. Paul urges us to flee from our sexual immorality. And he's really pointing back to this parallel we see over and over again from the Old Testament to the New Testament. That in the Old Testament, the Exodus, God rescued his people Israel from their slavery in Egypt. By the blood of the Passover lamb, they were spared from the last plague. And so they were then able to be set free from slavery in Egypt. But in the Passover, when they were eating the Passover meal, they were to eat it with their shoes on and their staff in hand, ready to go. Because the moment that Pharaoh said, you're free, leave, they should be ready to flee from Egypt, to get out as fast as they can. That's why they're literally sitting there eating the Passover meal, ready to run. Because the moment Pharaoh said, you're free, they should get out of there. Because what if he changes his mind? So they're ready to go. Paul says similarly, when we come to Christ and we are set free from our sin, we should be ready to flee from our sin. The only way we'll be ready to be, be, to be ready to flee from our sin, the only way we'll be willing and ready to run from our sin when we're set free from it is if we recognize the destructive nature of it. We recognize the harm that it can cause. We recognize it the same way, you, you know, Moses didn't have to convince the Israelites to be ready to run, right? They were ready. They wanted to get out. They wanted to be free. So they're ready to go. The moment the call came, hey, Pharaoh says we're free, they're ready to take off. So often we are not ready to go because we don't recognize it the same way. There was no convincing needed for the Israelites that slavery in Egypt was bad. But sometimes we need convincing that our sin is bad, that our sin is destructive. Be ready to flee from it, to run away from it. The same way that If you're out walking in a field and all of a sudden you come across a rattlesnake, you're going to run, right? If you're sane. If you're a sane person, you came across a rattlesnake in a field, you're going to turn and take off the other direction, right? You're not going to hang out. You're going to get closer to, oh, what's this? Oh, it's got something on its tail. It's kind of shaking, right? No, you're going to turn and run the other way. Why? Because you recognize what that rattlesnake could do to you. We have to have that same attitude towards our sin, be ready to flee from our sexual immorality. Paul points out that the the nature of sexual sin is unique because of how physical and emotional it is. That other sin is committed outside the body, but sexual, sexual, sexual immorality affects one's own body. It's so... Uh, because it is so intimate, because it is using our bodies themselves. Even something like murder is more external, even though it's very personal, very um, upfront, and we use our, our bodies, but not in the same way, not in as, in, as intimate of a way. And as believers, we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. I want you to make sure you understand what that means, that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And to understand that, we have to, again, go back to the Old Testament. Point, he's pointing back to the Old Testament and the nature of the temple. If you remember from when we studied um, Exodus and Leviticus, that's where they build the tabernacle. God gives them all the instructions to build the tabernacle. There's, it's very precise. Then they build the tabernacle. And then God's Spirit comes and dwells in the tabernacle. And then later it will be the temple. His spirit dwells in the tabernacle. And they have to take it very seriously, right? Do you remember immediately after it's all inaugurated, the minute after it's all ready to be used, two priests go, two sons of Aaron go, and they use it incorrectly, and they die. God takes it very seriously how they treat his temple, his tabernacle at the time. He takes it very seriously. That's how his spirit, his presence dwelt among his people was in the tabernacle. 
and later the temple. And what he's saying to us, and what the New Testament makes clear, is that now the way that God's Spirit dwells on earth is within believers, that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit, collectively. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. We are how God dwells on earth. That's an incredible responsibility if we understand it correctly and take it seriously. We are the way God goes out into the world. The way that his spirit dwells on earth is inside of believers because we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And as such, you are not your own because it is not just individually that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Collectively, we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. So we are not autonomous. And this is a controversial statement in our culture, right? It's an a, a almost anti-American statement, right? Uh, independence, autonomy is an American value, and we like to be very independent. But Paul is saying here, you are not your own. You were bought with a price. You were bought with the blood of Jesus. You belong to him. You belong to him. Your allegiance is owed to him. And as such, you are a member of the body of Christ. But you are not the body of Christ alone. You are a member of the body of Christ, which means we also are owed to each other. We also belong to one another. We are not autonomous. We belong to him, and we are joined together, united as the body of Christ. So collectively, we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And we are how God takes his message to the world. Now, I do want to point out that I know this is a sensitive topic. And uh, and it's possibly one that has brought up feelings of guilt or shame among some people. Because just as sexual sin is uniquely powerful in in the way that it, it harms us, because it is so uniquely emotional and physical, because it is so internal and so has powerful consequences, it also has the ability to cause powerful feelings of guilt and shame. And unfortunately, it has also uniquely been a a sin that is preached without grace. And so I want to make sure you don't hear that message because we must not make this unique sin uniquely unforgivable. It is not. It is not uniquely unforgivable. We must remember that there is no condemnation in Christ. I want to point us to John chapter 8, verses 2 through 11, where it says this, Early in the morning he came again to the temple. All the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. The scribes and Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery and placing her in the midst. They said to him, teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now, pause there for a second to show that their motives are, are bad and, 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 and also uh, hypocritical, right? They say this woman has been caught in adultery. Well, you can't commit adultery by yourself. And yet they only bring her. So already they're suspect. But then we also see that it says, now in the law, verse 5, Moses commanded us to stone such women. So what do you say? This they said to test him that they might have some charge to bring against him. Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. So they're, they're intentionally bringing this woman to see if Jesus will call for her to be executed. Because it is true that in, in the in the law of Moses, people who were caught in adultery were, were to be executed. Were to be, their capital punishment was the punishment for this crime. But they both, not such women, such people, right? People in general who were adulterers would be stoned. But they're really trying to catch him in, in breaking the law of Rome, because Rome had taken away the right of capital punishment from the people that they conquer. So if Jesus were to execute this woman, he would be breaking the law of Rome. And, and they, would, they would absolutely arrest him and, and kill him. So they're, they're trying to trap him. 
He says he bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. Verse 7, as they continued to ask him, he stood up and said to them, let him who is without sin be among you be the first to throw a stone at her. And once more he bent down and wrote on the ground. But when they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the older ones, and, was, and Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Jesus stood up and said to her, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, no one, Lord. Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on, sin no more. So, Jesus points out the fact that they are all sinners in need of grace, in need of saving. They are all sinners, and they recognize it one by one. It's possible that he's actually writing evidence on the ground. We don't know what he's writing. It doesn't really matter. Because what we see is that they are convicted of their sin, that they are all sinners. And he says, I don't condemn you either. Even though you were caught in sexual sin, forgiveness is available. Grace is available to you. It brings us back to Romans chapter 8 that we looked at earlier. It says, there is no, therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For those who have lived in sexual immorality, for those who have had sexual intercourse outside of God's design for marriage, there is forgiveness, there is restoration, that God can restore you, you can live under his design now. You are not permanently scarred, you're not permanently invalidated in any way. There is grace, there is mercy, there is forgiveness available to you, and you can now live the abundant life that God has always designed for you in, in following him, in recognizing that while not all things are lawful, that all things are lawful, but not all things are helpful, and that will not be dominated by anything. That he has the best in mind for us, that he wants to restore us, that he wants to use us to glorify him, and that should be our response to what Jesus has done for us is a desire to glorify him in all that we do. And that includes with how we use our physical bodies. We'll wrap up with this, three takeaways for today's message. Number one, consider your freedom to do what is best for you. Right? Consider the fact that we've been set free to live an abundant life, to live the way that God has designed us to live. So often, people approach Christianity, people approach the Bible and look for the rules and look for the loopholes and try to find a ways out of things, not recognizing the fact that he has set us free from our slavery to sin, that he has set us free from our, the destructive way of life that we are so prone to. He has given us the ability to be free not to sin, to be free to live as he designed us to live, to live the abundant life that he wants for us. Number two, identify yourself as a temple of the Holy Spirit. Identify yourself as a member of the body of Christ, as one indwelled by the Holy Spirit who has a mission to take God to the world. That is his design. That's how he designed to reach the world is through his people. And that includes you. Lastly, glorify God in all that you do. Seek in all that you do to bring him glory, to point to him first and foremost, that it's not about us, it's about him. I'm going to pray here in just a minute, and then we will uh, take communion together. Um, after that, we'll sing one final song, and then uh, after that, there will be a, a prayer team available over here. If you'd like prayer for anything, we'll have to pray for you. There are still some refreshments available over here, um, and lots of good info at the information table if you want to check that out. Would you bow with me now? Father, we thank you for this word this morning, and I pray that we would recognize the incredible privilege and responsibility you have given us as the temple of the Holy Spirit, as the means by which you take your message of grace, hope, love, peace, forgiveness to the world. May we be your messengers. May we live the abundant life that you've designed us to live and give you all of the glory. I pray these things in the blessed name of Jesus. Amen.